this is the Supercoach NRL official podcast. Round preview with Tom Sangster and Rob Sutherland. Hello, Super Coaches, and welcome to the NRL Super Coach Game Day Round 5 podcast. Tom Sangster isn't here. Rob Sutherland isn't here. Instead, you're stuck with me. I'm Dave Campbell, and joining me, very special guest, SC Playbooks, Timmy Williams. How are you, mate? Good, Dave. Yeah, thanks for having me, mate. I was about to say, Tommy, you're, you're looking good, mate. You're looking healthy. You've trimmed up a bit. And, uh, <laughs> mate, the dream team on deck for this week's podcast. Unfortunately, in honour of Rob Sutherland, no Hawaiian shirts for him today. So, uh, sorry about that, mate, but good to be along. Yes, well, you know, someone had to step up in their absence. Mm. Um, how are the Kuma Stallions? Kuma Stallions are going... Uh, oh, look, I'm glad I'm on this week and not last week because we, <laughs> we did have a big round four substantial improvement up into 26,000. I'm actually 26,999, so look, I'm just edging to the top 27,000. Uh, mate, team set up really well. I benefited big time cash generation-wise in that Dolphins game last week. Started the season with Tab UI Fido. I got Josh Kerr in last week, got on a bit late and scored a try. Uh, played Bostock, who I started the season with as well. So between those three guys. I earned close to 300k in the space of 80 minutes. So mate, team's looking good. Uh, now just need to, to get that ranking heading north a little bit. Great. Well, let's jump into it. So a little bit different this week. We need to talk about the most important thing, which is the weather. Mm. So we don't normally do weather forecasts but uh, this week it is going to have a massive impact on super coaches. New South Wales is expecting a lot of rain. So I'll just quickly go through each of the states. Victoria, um, that's the Melbourne game tonight, Melbourne v the Broncos. Um, 15 degrees at kickoff, clear skies, so looking good there. Queensland has a Saturday and a Sunday game. A couple of isolated storms, but temperatures in the mid-20s, low chance of showers. There shouldn't be much rain about there. Canberra, last game of the round on Sunday, clear skies, 18 degrees at kickoff. But New South Wales, that's that's the big one. Mm. There's four matches in New South Wales over Friday and Saturday. A huge rain event predicted, strong winds, falls of 100 millimetres expected across the east coast. Why does this matter for Supercoach? Uh, where do we start, mate? Firstly, some fairly Supercoach relevant fixtures across Friday and Saturday, Saturday obviously, with yourself with those, uh, those Sydney games. But... Where do we start? We've got captains is the big one. Uh, like this uh, massive rainfall that is predicted to, to come in. It's happened on a really difficult week with captains. Like you even look back to the start of the season and you had these, the obvious captaincy choices. Nathan Cleary, injured. Nico Hines, not had the best start to the year on the bye. Tommy Chaboyevich, struggled last week. He's got Penrith this week. And then you add in someone like Caelan Ponga, and we'll get deeper into the captaincy chat later, but Ponga, who looks probably the standout captain to me this week, if he's playing with 100 mil of rain under his feet, it's going to make things very hard going. The play is going to be a lot less expansive, probably a lot more through the middle. So captaincy choices is one thing. The other thing, maybe, is your sit-v start. So a player like Morgan Smith is, who's very highly owned, who's his minutes are reducing a little bit. You probably ideally don't want to be playing him in your starting 17 and scoring points for your team this week. But... You know, if you've got outside backs in those rain-impacted games, they become very risky plays in your 17. So it's going to change, certainly, my thinking towards this. And someone like Morgan Smith is who should play 60 to 70 minutes, hopefully more, get through his work rate. If he can punch out 45 to 50, I'm happier to do that than play an outside back in one of those rain-affected games where the attacking opportunities might be very limited. It's um, it, it's a big thing for super coaches to look at, and and as we get into the burning issues for tonight's game, um, you know, we see some really relevant players there, and, and they're not rain affected. I guess the first person to talk about is, is probably Harry Grant. Um, is given the rain in New South Wales over the weekend, is he a straight captain? Stra- you know, first game up, get it out of the way, dry track. Yeah, I don't mind it at all. I really don't. I'm not a Harry Grant owner. I know we were talking pre-show about um, Harry Grant and you being an owner going the straight C. Look, I would. As I said, I, th- I think on a normal weekend, if there was not this major concern about the weather, and just another thing on the weather, rain-impacted games are fine. If there's you know a few mills there and it's a bit, ju- bit dewy, a bit wet, whatever, all good. But when there's this massive downpour, it becomes very, very difficult to... Uh, for scoring all round. So yeah, look, Harry Grant, if I could lock him in as a captain on a Thursday night, it's expected to be 
a tight game against the Broncos. I think he'll play his 80 minutes, every chance of some attacking stats. If I owned Harry, I'd be straight seeing. Yep. Oh, sorry, let me preface that. The Cowboys boys. We'll get to captains later, yep. but if you own Cowboys players, that is the matchup this yeah. week. Um, Cam Munster. First game after you know his mysterious shower injury. Mm. Um, do you, do you think we'll see Cam Munster slotting straight in doing Cam Munster things, or, or will he be a bit slow to start? It's hard to say because you know the Storm have started the season well. Jonah Pezet's been in there and deputised really well for Cam Munster, so they haven't needed to rush him back, and they wouldn't be rushing him back this week if they weren't very confident that he was ready to go. So, look, match fitness might take a little bit of time to come back, but Munster comes in, slots into the six. Uh, he's a big watch for super coaches in that 5-8 position that has played this a little bit to start the season. It's been quite tough, so Cam Munster, I assume he'd be in his 0% ownership, a big watch over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing, you know, um, uh, Cam Munster, um, he's in the team now, 5-8, it's been a wasteland, really, mm. for, um, for super coaches. You've got Dylan Brown at the Eels, and then daylight between him and anyone else that's that's half decent and and to be honest Dylan Brown hasn't exactly set the world on fire mm. either so um, if Cam Munster comes in fires straight away um, at least it gives us options yeah we need them <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned Ryan Pappenhausen um, a lot of coaches are actually bringing him in this week he's got a break even of negative six about a six hundred and ninety one thousand dollar price tag um, would you be bringing him in Look, I don't want to waste, I shouldn't say waste, I don't want to utilise trades this early in the season on the, on the fullback spot and have this fullback rotation where whether you've got Drinky, Tommy Turbo, Ponga, Latrell, whoever it might be, there are so many gun fullbacks who are just as likely as each other to score 100 plus. Now, I think after a slow start of the season, cash generation-wise, we're starting to see some of these cheapies come through, some big money being made. So if you were looking at Pappy and going, all right, I'll do it for the cash, I don't mind. But look, it's a very tough matchup against the Broncos tonight. Just depends who you're trading to him. Like, I know a lot of trading Tommy Turbo out. He's got two horrible matchups in a row. Penrith this week into the Warriors, over the ditch next week. So it doesn't get much uh, easier anytime soon. But I don't mind the Pappenhausen play, but... The way I'm structuring my side, I'm trying to get the strongest 17 that I can as quick as I can, whilst, of course, focusing on cash generation. Fullback's not an issue for me. I've got Turbo. He's not going anywhere. I started with Ponga, Ponga and Turbo. Happy with that. Uh, I'm going to focus on strengthening my side in other areas. 5 eight is the spot that you mentioned. Front row forward. It's been a wasteland so far, so fullback's not an issue for me. No knock on Pappenhausen, but nah. Yeah. Um, one of the areas a lot of coaches have been looking to beef up this week on one of them um, is the second row. Mm. Um, guys like Satili Tupanua, who, you know, last week they lost some minutes to Angus Crichton. This week, Angus is starting and Satili's been benched, so you think there's more loss of minutes there. Um, you've mentioned guys like Morgan Smithies. A lot of us have these mid ranges in. Um, people are now starting to kind of, I think, move on from that experiment. They want more points in their second row. Um, Elisa Katawa tonight, Paddy versus Paddy Carrigan tonight. Um, uh, both solid second row options. Um, are any of those worth consideration? Yeah, look, isn't it interesting? We started the season and by far and above, the, the best value position where you thought, right, there's guys here who they're undervalued for whatever reason it might be. There's scoring potential here. They're locked into big minutes. It looked awesome. And it just hasn't quite ventured that way, has it? Like, Pia Kura is one that was heavily owned. Not his fault. There's a, an early HIA in round one, uh, injured again, and now he's out for a month. Uh, but there's been numerous examples of that. Morgan Smithies hasn't quite hit the ground running, scoring-wise. I think he's had two tackle breaks in four weeks. So big work rate, but just no attacking the bloke. Uh, of the guys you mentioned, Angus Crichton is a huge watch this week. He came on and played about 23 minutes against the Panthers last weekend. He was running some vintage Angus Crichton lines. Now, we know he had a bit of a plague year in 2023. Impacted his super coach scoring, his minutes. He's been carving up New South Wales Cup this season. He's about 409k, break even in the mid 70s. So I've seen people looking at going early on him. Do not do it. Let's see how he returns at NRL level. Let's see him get the minutes because if he's anything under 60, it'll be a waste of time. If he gets anything back to near his best, Angus Crichton plays towards that 80 minute mark. Give it two weeks. Like he'll probably drop money this week. We can bank him in a week or two. What do you think about Paddy Carrigan? Paddy Carrigan doesn't change for me just because 
his high work rate again. There's no attacking stats. He's peaked towards his uh, price towards his peak, I should say. Like. I think there are better value options at this stage of the season. Look, if you get him in, he'll do his work. He won't let you down, but I'm looking elsewhere. You mentioned Eli Katoa. Eli Katoa's a really high upside guy. Thrived with Jerome Hughes as well. So Hughes missed round three due to suspension before the Storm had the buy last week. Uh, but I think if you wanted to plug Eli Katoa in there, I think he's a better option than Paddy Carrigan. Yeah. Um, last thing on tonight's game, uh, Xavier Willison. He's been replaced by Benjamin Takura, the massive 205 centimetre player. Um, uh, Willison uh, had a bit of a knock at training mm. on Monday, so he hasn't been dropped. Um, would you expect to see him kind of back in the side? next week? Yeah, I think so. Obviously don't have sort of too, too many details around the head knock. I think suffered at training, but if it was just a, a smallish one and nothing too serious, hopefully uh, week off, back in next week, he'll still be a couple more weeks away, paying Haas, but that will of course impact uh, Xavier Wilson, but Wilson was one of the most purchased players this week. Obviously with Haas out, there was some minutes to go around in the middle. Wilson, big work rate, was getting some decent game time, so we can recess that, that, that one next week, but I know there are a lot of super coaches out there looking to plug him into the second front row forward position this week. Uh, has an event trade, unfortunately, but yeah, keep an eye on him for next week. Yep. Um, we'll jump over to some questions. Um, so Nathan, uh, looking for his last reserve, um, Ben Trebojevic or Ethan Strange? Ethan Strange, I think uh, pretty easy one there. Benny Trebojevic, minutes are dropping. 60 minutes two weeks ago, he played 50 minutes last week. I still don't mind Chaboyevich as a whole, but you look at... And then you add in there. They're versus the Penrith Panthers, meant to be in the wet on Saturday. Ethan Strange gets what should be a relatively dry game in Canberra on Sunday night. Uh, good ball running game. As I said, he'll play his 80 minutes, so Strange. Yeah, I think Strange as well. It's just that um, the upside there mm. is better. Um, you know, he he seems relatively solid for like a... like gets an okay score but if he if he lays on a couple of tries yeah um, obviously you see that and that's up. the other thing uh, I'm just thinking out loud but uh, he'll be strange to play on the left side which will be going at Blaze Tulungi the rookie on the right side slotting in at 5-8 there so it's a pretty decent matchup they could send a, or they will send a fair bit of traffic at him because uh, on the left side of the Eels Dylan Brown he's one of the best probably in my opinion the best defensive half in the NRL so I think they're going to go to that left side of strange a uh, decent opportunity there yeah. um, Mitch is asking, do you think Zach Hosking is a sell? I think if you have... Look, I think Blaze Talangi is near enough a must-have this week. 204k, you're about to make a ton of money, goodbye. If, he, if, if you're through dual positions, like Ben Trevojevic being one of them, if Hosking is your ticket to, say, to get Talangi in, yeah, I'd be selling him. But... Like Zach Hosking, he misses this week due to a head knock. He scored poorly last week because he played half the game due to that failed head knock. Just need to see a little bit more news. It's been a little bit uh, mysterious around Elliot White and how long he's out for, but Zach Hosking could come back in next week. I mean, 80 minute play uh, at relatively low ownership. So if you can hold, I'd hold, but I do understand that there are some pressing trades to be made. Squad's getting a bit stronger, so if you need to trade him, it's okay. Yep. Simon um, asking Sean Johnson. <sighs> What do you reckon? Yeah, I'm tempted by him. Look, I'm not going to be getting him, but he's 662k. He has a pretty decent run of fixtures coming up. Again, impacted by the rain this weekend in Sydney, but doesn't overly worry me. The big thing with SJ this week, there's a few. He's got the goal kicking back. He actually had that back before uh, Luke Metcalf suffered that unfortunate injury last week. But Charles Nickel Cookstack comes back in for the Warriors at fullback. Massive for SJ, massive for Dallin with Tennis Lesniak. Just their attack on that right edge clicks so, so much better with Chance there. So, look, goal kicking, good draw. So, Bunnies into Manly, into the Dragons, into the Titans. I like him as a buyer, I really do. Yep. Uh, Ross Mann says they've got the big guns on. He's a good man, Ross Mann. <laughs> I, can't, I can't disagree mm. with, um, with that assessment. Yeah, talking sense. Um, uh, who's the better captain's choice? Hammer or Arpi Coruscant? Oof. I would lean towards Api Coruscant. I think Hammer, like it's a good matchup, obviously against the Tigers up in Queensland, going to be dry. We know the upside in Hammer. He's averaging, what, 95 all across his three games this year on a tear. 
there's going to be some low ones in there, though. And look, the Tigers have been pretty good this season, so... I just think Appy's going to be more reliable, only about 44 on the weekend, no attacking stats to boot, but again, a dry game against the Dolphins who have been leaky at stages this season, if the Tigers put on a few points, he's goal kicking, he's got the keys to the attack there at the Tigers, I think it's a much safer play. Yep. I mean, Hammer, rocks or diamonds, oh, he, he could bang out 150 and you'd be laughing. He, he could, could. He could also smash out a 30. Exactly. And you're crying. He could smash out a 15, mate. Like, <laughs> I, I'm a very happy owner, but I'm not ballsy enough to cap the yeah, boat. Yeah. All right, we'll move on. Um, rant of the week. My rant, honestly, Tom Sangstar, Rob Sutherland, mm. Wilson Smith, all on leave at the same time. They've thrown us under the bus, begged us to come in and cover for them. I don't know who approves leave in this building, but honestly, the, the fact that they were even granted leave during football season is a travesty. Did it have anything to do... Uh, you had a big score on the weekend, mate. It was 11.50-odd, maybe even more. You went yep. huge. So did the, uh, the powers that be at News Corp headquarters, did they just say, look, Sangster, you're out, Campbell, you're in? Well... If they did do that, they clearly didn't look at my first two weeks scores <laughs> because they, they were pretty dire. What's your rant, mate? Mate, speaking for 150-odd thousand super coaches here, and my rant is get Josh Curran dual position. He's been named on the edge this week with Jacob Preston, but he's been coming on off the bench for the Doggies this season, playing as an out-and-out prop forward, as a middle. He's been on the field at the same time as Jamin Salmon. I know you look at someone like Pat Garrigan, he gets named as a 13 and has that 2RF and, and not the front row forward status. Salmon's been playing as the lock. Curran's coming on as a middle. He's played his three games there, so he ticks the box for the dual position and uh, the, the eligibility there. Give the people what they want. Josh Carr and dual position next week. Well, let's talk about dual positions. Um, this this is the week. So <laughs> um, at, after round five, um, if there's a player, um, they're named in a certain position, but they've actually been playing... Sorry, they're, they're a position in Supercoach, but they've actually been playing a different position on the field each week. Um, at the end of round five... Um, assuming they're not already a dual position player in anywhere else, they'll they'll be upgraded to to DPP status. Um, there's a couple of players who are kind of certainty. So you've got Max Plath; mm. he'll definitely get it. Um, there's a couple of players who are knows at the moment, but maybe they'll get it in the next round. So I'm looking at Dylan Brown and, and Blaze Talangi there. We missed it by one week. Yeah, one week. Moses so. needed to get hurt a week earlier, and we would have had jewels for both of those guys. Yep. So they're assuming they keep playing uh, the numbers that they mm. that they they've been locked into the last two weeks. They will um, they'll get it in the next round, but they've just missed the cutoff yeah. for this week. But uh, yeah, Curran is the one that everyone's talking about everyone wants it I know he's in Tom Sankster's side I'm not saying that has any bearing on whether he'll get it or not it'll help though but um, yes I'm you sure, know it'll help I'm sure it helps um, but but DPP um, definitely one to keep an eye out um, once lockout ends for this round those will be into the system and mm. available for round six yeah on Josh Curran it's such a significant obviously we've campaigned and campaigned for it there's been rallies down the streets of Belmore to get Josh Curran dual position uh, it's so significant for Supercoach because this as we said a wasteland at front row forward this season I think most own Terrell May out there and everyone else has been struggling to fill that second slot, if not the second, the third and fourth reserve slots there. Uh, if Curran can get his dual front row, he becomes near enough a season-long keeper. Not saying he's going to punch out scores like Fanua Blake or Payne Haas, you know, the big, big dogs, but he'll do a good enough job there. Won't be uh, origin impacted, so very keen. Just make it happen. <laughs> Just give it to us. Well... We'll have to, you know, contact Tom Sankster, yeah. probably sunning himself on a beach somewhere and, and make sure he puts yeah. in a call. Um, if we move on to some of our other talking points for the round, so um, Tom Eisenhuth at mm. the Dragons, named at starting lock. Um, do you think he'll actually start? I don't know, because obviously I think he was named to start last week and was a late scratching on the bench, but mate, let's, let's talk about Tommy Eisenhuth for a second because he's really flown under the radar. I know at the start of the season people considering he had that dual CT dub to RF positioning and then uh, Luciano Le Lua, the rumours were there that he was going to sign and people were going, alright, Luciano is going to come down take his spot on the edge, Eisenhuth fades off into the abyss. He hasn't quite done that. He's averaging 55 points per game in 49 minutes 44 in base in that time. Last weekend against Para, 
para, not para, manly. Yep, manly. Uh, he had nine tackle busts, which Tom Eisenhuth, nine tackle busts. Like, what's doing? So, look, break even of six, four thirty k. I don't think I'd be buying, but anyone who did jump on earlier in the season, they'd be cheering because Tommy's doing a good job. Even if he does get benched, he'll still play decent minutes, I reckon, in that vicinity of 50 to 60 anywhere. And obviously, rain-affected match, assuming he can hold on to the ball. Yeah. And like you said, a lot more play up the middle of the field. He, he's probably on for a, a bigger base than what he otherwise That's would. That's it, mate. And, and while the, these rain-impacted games, they hurt certainly outside backs, spine players... For your, your forwards, and in particular middle forwards, the game all goes down the middle because no one wants to use the ball, no one wants to spread it wide, so uh, good for someone like Tommy yeah. Eisenhuth. Um, David Fafita, um, named on the bench again, obviously his first match back last year. Mm. He did well, 57 points in 55 yeah. minutes off the bench. Um, <coughs> do you think um, Des, Desi will pull a, pull a sneak in actually starting this week, or, or is he still going to ease him back? through the bench. Yeah. Look, uh, he's about the only good thing coming out of the Titans at the moment, Dave Feeder, and I think Desi has to start him. Like, the way they've started the season, they need a, a bit of flair and a bit of a, a bit of X factor on the field from the, the get-go. Obviously, match fitness, like, how's it come down to? But as you said, he played off the bench last week, got his 55-odd minutes, uh, looked okay. To partner him up with Foz on that left edge again, it changes this team entirely. We saw a good little combination with Fafida uh, and Jaden Campbell for a little in-out ball uh, where Campbell went through last weekend. I suspect Fafida will start. As I said, I don't think Desi has much of a choice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had a question about Sean Johnson earlier, so let's talk about the Warriors for a bit. So, Dallin Wateni is a Lesniak. Missed training with a with a bit of a leg injury, but expected to play is your late mail. Yep. Um, I guess him and Shanzi, um, Clock, Nickel Clockstad back as well. How how do the Warriors all fit together now with 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 these guys? Just the whole right edge becomes so much more super coach relevant. Uh, and the big one is that man you mentioned, in Dallin with Tennis Lesniak. So you sort of, I think he's, he's got two tries so far this season, but they've had Tane Torpiki and Roger Tuovasashek deputising fullback so far this season. Both done a great job, both terrific footballers. In fact, Roger Tuovasashek is a bit of a freak. He's not a ball playing fullback, nor is Tor Picky. So it's really stunted uh, you know, the, com the new combinations on the right edge with SJ. We saw all last year, particularly in the back end, it was just SJ digging deep into the line, Chan's out the back, Chan's going whack and giving the flat cut out ball or the loft one over the top to a tennis of Lesniak. So Dallin at uh, 725k, he's still averaging 64 this season despite not a lot of attacking stats. I would have been tempted to go a little bit of a flyer on him as a, as a little pod play, but the rain in Sydney, wary of the bounce back factor from the bunnies who need to show something. Uh, I won't be doing it yet, especially a high break even of near three figures. So holding off, but Dallin, massive play in the next few weeks. On the radar. Um, Sam Hughes at the Bulldogs. Mm. So he's... Um, one of those cheapies, we thought, yes, make a bit of money. Might be a bit of a slow burn. He um, uh, he just hasn't gotten the minutes. He, yeah. his, his points per minute is actually good. He's scoring at a point per minute. But last week, he only had 14 minutes on the field. He actually lost money last week, <laughs> despite his price being so low. However, Preston's out. Um, the doggies have been forced into a bit of a shuffle. And, and, and Sam Hughes is starting. Where do you think that puts him? The one thing I will say about Sam Hughes is that all the word out of the doggies, and I think Gus Gould even tweeted it in the preseason, um, they said that he was going to be eased into minutes. Leading into this season, I think he had a grand total of two NRL games for a total of about 80 minutes, if that. They said that they were going to build him into minutes throughout the year, and here we are, granted it's been impacted a little bit by injury to Jacob Preston last week, but he's now starting. The concern is obviously they've got a four forward bench, which they've been running with all year. Uh, they've got Kitioni Katonga debuting off the bench, who's an edge back row, who's been, uh, he killed the trials, and he's absolutely been tearing up uh, the, the New South Wales Cup this season as well. So minutes become a question mark. I would think that Hughes provided he does start, plays that first 20 to 25 minutes, comes back on hopefully for a 15, 20 minute stint. There's just question marks about how Cameron Serrato is using his bench this season because another 
I mean, I don't want to call him disappointing, Poasso Farmacilli, as a super coach buyer to start the year because I don't think anyone who started with him was expecting much. There was just no one else to go with, especially when Xavier Willison was ruled out in Vegas. So, but Farmacilli started the year and was playing like 15 minutes in his first stint. Mm-hmm. So I'm just hoping that Hughes doesn't do that, then goes to the bench like Farmacilli was. I don't think he will, but hopefully for the the mass owners of Sam Hughes, we see decent minutes and he can start generating a bit of cash for us. He lost money last week, as we said, but so a lot of people this week are actually trading him out. Um, would you trade trading him? Trading out Sam Hughes? Yep, yep, yep. Would you trade him now that he's starting? Absolutely not. I mean, firstly, who are you trading him to? There's not many good, cheapy front row forward options. We've got Liam Henry there who's making a bit of money, but he had his big cash rise last week. James Fisher-Harris is back at prop. Uh, for the Panthers, so minutes are going to be impacted to Liam Henry there, so I don't really know who they're going to. Look, as it stands, Josh Curran's on the edge, so that's one big minute middle forward who's gone out of their rotation. So there's no reason why Sam Hughes can't increase his minutes. As they said, build into game time. Look, would I want to be playing in my 17? Absolutely not, but I just don't see I don't see who you're moving to, so no, I'd be holding. Yeah. Um, let's Move on to no-go zone. Uh, my no-go zone this week is um, Lockie Galvin. So there are about more than 2,000 coaches have traded Lockie Galvin in. Um, totally get it. He's been playing well. Break-even's great. He's going to make cash, even if you miss that initial price rise from him. However, he's missing two games. He's, they've accepted the ban for that hip-drop tackle on the weekend you don't need to bring him in this week. In fact, you can wait two more weeks and not worry about missing out on any of that that cash generation. Um, I don't... Surely there's other issues in people's teams at the moment that they need to get in guys who are actually going to be on the field, not a guy who's going to sit there for two weeks doing nothing. Yeah, look, if you've got Galvin in your team... Or sorry, if you're getting Galvin in your team this week, you've got rocks in your head. Because just imagine... Imagine if he gets injured at training over the next two weeks and you've brought a bloke in who's not only not played for your team, hasn't made any cash, and it just achieves nothing. Yeah. So, and look, it, it'd be slightly different if he was still bottom dollar at 204K and he hadn't had that big initial cash rise, but he has. Like, if you're doing it to free up cash to do big trades elsewhere, but uh, after that big cash rise, mate, no point going early on him. Yep. Um, who's your no-go? My no-go is uh, not an an entirely no-go, but a proceed with caution, and it's Justin Olam, who's, I think, maybe the third most traded-in player this week. Look, he's looked sensational this year for the Tigers Mm. in his couple of outings. He's just historically never been a supercoach player. And I'll rattle off a couple of stats for you from recent years. So 2023, at a far better team in the Melbourne Storm, 15 games, he had one score over 54. He had 12 scores in those 15 that were sub-50. Head back to 2022, he played 23 games for the Storm, had 14 scores under 50, 10 scores under 40. Now, why I say it's not entirely no-go is he has a break-in of negative 40. So if you bring him in, he's going to make cash. It's not a bad buy. It just reeks to me of a, you bring him in as a short-term cash grab and there's every chance that he comes out and scores 40-40 and you're trading him out of your team in two weeks. Now, he might come out this weekend score a try, get 80 odd points, earn a ton of cash. Happy days. I just, I can see him being sold yep. in two weeks' time. Fair enough. Um, we'll finish up with some questions, but a lot of questions are around captaincy, so we'll roll into that very quickly first. A lot of people, after we talked about Harry Grant earlier, are asking, wouldn't you just be seeing him instead of a straight captain with the, with the possibility of, if he does well, using the loophole. Um, the reason I'm looking at him as a straight captain is, um, is who else can I rely on uh, if, if he doesn't perform and I want to captain someone else? I'm probably, given all the rain in Sydney, I'm probably looking at having to captain someone like Hammer, mm. and that scares me. So I'm, I'm thinking... Maybe I just go the straight captain on Harry Grant so I don't have to sweat bullets while the Dolphins are playing up north. I like it. If I had Harry Grant, I'd be doing just that. Like He's a proven gun of the NRL. He's the best hooker in the game. He's a gun super coach player. Big game against Brisbane. They're fresh off the bye. He'll be good to go, playing massive minutes. And as you said, he, you don't have to worry about things for the rest of the weekend. If he comes out and gets 60 or 70, which is every chance to do, I'm like, you take that. Um... <sighs> 
they said the best captaincy options this week if you own Scott Drinkwater for the Cowboys against the Titans in Townsville should be a dry game happy days Val Holmes is another good one if you've paid up for Val but it's pretty slim pickings elsewhere so I'm probably looking I've got it on Caelan Palmer at the moment and I've got a bit of a pod play this week for the time being in Joey Manu boosted to get him in just strengthening my CT dub a little bit um, VC on him but if I do go cold on Ponga, which I'm every chance to do with the rain, I'm possibly looking at it. might sound a little bit silly, but Dylan Brown gets what should be a relatively dry game Sunday evening down in the capital against the Raiders. You know, they conceded 36 on the weekend in pretty quick succession. So Brown was an inch away from making three, three line breaks last week. Mitch Moses is out. He's playing a bigger role in attack. Far from perfect, but, man, it's a tough week for skippers. Yeah. Um, Rod says uh, he's got Nico on the bye, but he actually kept Cleary as well. So mm. so he's got no one there at, at half back this week. Um, he's he's basically asking, is it worth risking an AE, or or should he look at trading one of those boys out to get someone in who's playing? I would trade. Just because I'll be holding Nico. He scored well last week on the bye this week, but back next week. You miss Cleary this week, Penrith on the bye next week. So you've got a massive, massive price. Hey, what's Cleary? Close to 900k, 850k or something. A lot of money on your bench for two key weeks of the season where you're looking at cash gen, doing all that sort of stuff. So I would sell Cleary. The option there is, though, like you mentioned the questions before and concerns around straight captaining Harry Grant. You can do an early vice-captaincy option, be it in the first or second game, whatever it might be. And if your vice-captain does go well, you get essentially a free crack at the VC loophole. You can then put your captaincy on Hines or Cleary, whoever you want to do, and not have to worry about trading one of those players out. You can hold on to both of them. Uh, if it doesn't pay off, though, yeah, I'd be looking at trading one of them out, and I think Sean Johnson's a, at a good price. Um, Aaron says, Tim Williams is Dave Campbell from Wish. Mm. So I think that's a sledge on you sledge and on compliment, uh, compliment for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, fair call. <laughs> I've, I've been aiming for that hairstyle for a long time, mate. Just need to trim it up a little bit. It's natural, mate. <laughs> um, uh, if Brown gets dual position, it will mean Luai should also. Well, I mean, Brown's not going. Well, Brown will potentially, mm. but... Further down the track. Further down the track. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because they're, they're out and out 5'8", but due to injuries in the side, they they find themselves playing halfback, essentially. So, you know, it depends how the, those at Supercoach HQ decide these exact things, but we know the consistencies in it are that you need there needs to be a three-game sample size of doing it. So in Brown and Talungi's case, where Brown's gone to seven, Talungi's gone from the centres to 5'8", yep. uh, They've only got two games in. So yeah. they don't tick that box. Mitchie Moses is out long term. So provided it stays that way in the next round of updates, which is round 12, they'll both get it. And then on Luai, yeah, if he's been named in the seven, then in theory, yes. Yeah. Uh, Daniel William is very, very passionate about Selwyn Cobbo. Says he's got the, the captain on him uh, Oof. tonight. Jeez. What do you think of that move? I mean, they put... Was it 40 odd points on the Cowboys last week? And Cobo scored 24 points. Uh, and they're going down to the graveyard in Melbourne to play the Melbourne Storm. I, I don't like it, no. VC, put a VC on him, sure, but not, I wouldn't have seen him. Yeah. Um, we'll wrap up with this question from Josh. Um, Hopgood. Uh, is he a good purchase this week? I was worried about him last week because he obviously he got started mm. from the bench last week, but then he, he came on. Um, I think he, he broke that line late, um, so he got a few attacking stats there. So I think and he ended up getting what eighty two points, eighty two, yeah, coming off the bench. So I know he's he's very expensive though. What do you what do you think? Well, Brad Arthur, very very weird man with his bench rotations. Like I think last week, Hopgood who basically always starts. Similar thing happened last year, come to think of it. He went Hopgood because he was like one of the greatest cheapies of all time. And he'd earn a fair bit of money, but not only about 200k. And it got to about round seven or something. He'd played enormous minutes to start the year. Mm. So he went back to the bench one game and played like 30 minutes. And everyone panics old and like, are you serious? Like, this dude is so good. It was a one-week thing because he played so many big minutes. 
he's done similar this season. Played like 61 minutes against Manly, 71 against the Panthers. I think he's a minimum of 60 minute player for them. He might go back to the bench for them this week again, but I think that's a little bit weird. I think Junior Bolo is probably more likely to play off the bench with Campbell Gillard starting. Look, at 758k, break even in the 90s, I I wouldn't be buying this week. No. Yeah, I enough. think there's more pressing trades. Fair enough. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you for joining us, and thanks also to Timmy Williams for popping in. Good luck this week, and may all your trades be good ones. <sighs> I said, the best captaincy options this week, if you own. Scott Drinkwater for the Cowboys against the Titans in Townsville. Should be a dry game. Happy day.